So we are going to get started in just a minute here. Um, Blair and Lee, if you can turn on your cameras, we'd love to see you. Okay, we're all here. Okay, so it's uh, we're going to get started um, for our program this evening. Um, so welcome to a conversation with Blair Kamen and Lee Bay, authors of Who is the City For? Architecture, Equity, and the Public Realm in Chicago. I'm Ross Topolsky with the Vernon Area Public Library, and I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Grace Hayek from the Glencoe Public Library and Beth Keller from the Highland Park Public Library. So architecture and specifically Chicago architecture is one of those subject matters that our library patrons love. And so we're really pleased to bring this program to you tonight. We're using the webinar format of Zoom for this evening. So you can put your questions for Blair and Lee into the Q&A and we'll, we'll make sure your questions are answered at the end of the program. If you have any technical questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll be sure to check with you there. Um, we're really grateful for the support of a local independent bookseller, The Bookstall, um, located in Winnetka. And we'll put a link in the chat once we get started so that you can purchase the book. And at the end of the evening, you'll see a survey on your screen. And we hope that you'll take just a minute to complete the survey so, because we would love to get your feedback. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Grace, and she's going to tell you about tonight's speakers. Thank you, Roz. Um, yes, so uh, tonight we have um, Blair Kamen and Lee Bay. Um, we will start by um, with Mr. Kamen. From his high-profile battles with Donald Trump to his insightful celebrations of Frank Lloyd Wright to front-page takedowns of Chicago mega-projects such as Lincoln Yards, Blair Kamen has long informed and delighted readers with his illuminating commentary. Mr. Kamen was the architecture critic, critic for Chicago Tribune for 28 years and was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 1999. He is the author or editor of several books, including Why Architecture Matters, Lessons from Chicago, and Terror and Wonder, Architecture in a Tumultuous Age. Who is the City For? pairs 55 of Mr. Kamen's columns with striking, there it is, thank you, Raz, with striking new images by photographer and architecture critic Lee Bay. Mr. Bay is an editorial writer and architecture critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. He is the author of Southern Exposure, the Overlooked Architecture of Chicago's South Side, which is the first book devoted to the South Side's rich and unfairly ignored architectural heritage. Previously, the former, director, the former Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daly's Deputy Chief of Staff for Architecture and Urban Planning, Mr. Bay has had photographs published in the New York Times and Architectural Digest. Thanks so much to both of you for being here with us tonight, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, Grace. We really appreciate um, a chance to visit with uh, this audience, and um, we really are appreciative of the um, of this presentation organized by the Vernon Area, Highland Park, and Glencoe um, Public Libraries. Um, it's it's great to be here. Lee, do you want to? Lee, you know your microphone is muted. So if you could turn that on, that'd be, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, sorry about that. Uh, uh, yeah, great to be here. Uh, and great and from some people, great for me to be back. Uh, Roz had me out about a year, year and a half ago, uh, or a little bit more, talking about my book, Southern Exposure. Uh, so it's good to be here. So I guess this is going to be interesting because we're going to interview each other. And I know the time is going to go by fast. So I guess if there's no other concerns, I'll just jump right in. Um, and Blair, I, I want to ask, you, you think I know the answer to this question, uh, why write this book and why write it now? Well, um, after I left the Tribune, um, I decided that I would write, um, put together a third collection of my columns. Uh, I had done two previously with the University of Chicago Press, each one covering a decade. Uh, the 90s and then the aughts, and now this one largely covering the teens and the early uh, 20s. Um, the question why now and why is this, why should we care about this book now really has to do with the issue of equity. Um, mm -hmm. As you and I both know, 
equity is a huge issue in Chicago right now. Uh, Chicago has really become a kind of tale of two cities. On the one hand, as exemplified by your cover image of the Bean in Millennium Park, there's a glamorous downtown with its Michelin-starred restaurants, million-dollar condos, and dazzling gathering spaces like Millennium Park. And then there are um, areas of the South and West Sides that have been struggling, and um, they are not without hope, not without um, important historic buildings that, as you pointed out in your book, should be saved, but they are struggling and they do need help. And so um, this book, uh, I hope, will remind us that as Chicago is about to elect a new mayor, the issue of equity matters, not just the gun violence that has uh, gotten all the attention on television news and uh, and the headlines in the newspapers. Now, you know, the uh, the, the lack of equity that you, that you speak of uh, is the result of, you know, decades and decades and decades, if not a century, of uh, disinvestment in some of these neighborhoods, uh, placing downtown first and, and the neighborhoods, particularly the black and brown neighborhoods, second, uh, if not third. Uh, what's changed, if anything, um, in recent years under Rahm uh, Emanuel, the, the previous mayor, uh, and under Lori Lightfoot, the current mayor? Well, Rahm was in large part a continuation of Rich Daly's reign. They were pragmatic, centrist, democratic mayors. They largely focused on downtown. Um, they did occasional projects uh, on the South and West sides. But as you said correctly, these were kind of like crumbs uh, thrown to these areas. They were not a, a systematic um, redevelopment strategy. Lori, uh, in one of her best moves, I would say, brought on a new planning commissioner whose name is Maurice Cox. And Maurice had worked um, some wonders in Detroit uh, as that city's planning commissioner, uh, helping to revive Detroit's downtown and planting seeds for revival in the city's neighborhoods. Here, he's really followed a similar playbook. And his idea was from the beginning that he would focus on what he called the city's soul, its neighborhoods, rather than its heart, its downtown. And so he has put together um, a redevelopment program called Invest Southwest. And the idea of that program, as you know, is to redevelop commercial corridors in 10 communities on the south and west sides. Some people would say, oh, this is crazy. This is never going to happen. No one's ever going to invest money there. Like, what a ridiculous idea that is. But in fact, the um, this effort has amassed $2.2 billion in public and private and philanthropic contributions. And there are plans uh, in place by very good architects and construction uh, is supposed to start this month in December on some of them. And, so, and, and, also, and, and if I could just jump in, and those those three entities that you named, government, of course, uh, private developers, but also phil the philanthropics, these are the movers now. I mean, these weren't the movers, let's say, back when Richard J. Daly, the old man, was mayor, mm -hmm. or in some respects when Richard M. Daly was mayor. It was the downtown business people. It was the Central Area Committee. You know, it was those kind of players. Yeah. But uh, but the action has shifted a bit. And and do you think? And does this program kind of reflect that? I think it does. I mean, I think that um, there's really an attempt here to build not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. and a lot of this effort is um, while Cox and Lightfoot, you know, had this vision there's been a lot of interchange with the communities uh, over these plans. And, you know, they took a lot of heat in some areas. Like some people said, we don't want so much affordable housing. We want more retail, which is understandable, given that some areas on the South side are retail deserts. So um, it is a different strategy. And it's also a different strategy in terms of the public-private partnership. And the public-private partnership is the, the way of doing things that say built Millennium Park. You know, that's how Daly, Daly got the crowns and the Pritzkers and, 
you know, the other Medici of Chicago to kick in big bucks. And so that's why we have the Bean and the Crown Fountain and the Lurie Garden. Uh, so, I mean, but in this case, the private, the public private partnership is being used not for the downtown, not for the lakefront, but for the cities, some of the city's poorest and most struggling neighborhoods. That's a significant change. And it, it actually really reflects something that's going on nationally where other uh, cities or nonprofits are, are doing the same thing because they realize, and this is a key point of the book, you can't have a good city unless you have a just city, a city where everyone has an opportunity to thrive. Now talk about what it was like revisiting uh, these, these columns and also frame the time for us. I mean, the last 10 years, uh, I guess, is almost, well, it's just past the end of Daly's term, Richard M. Yep. It's into Roms and, and into, um, and into Lori, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's. But give us a sense of the times that, 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 that we're in when these columns are coming out, what you're grappling with as a writer, and how was it like uh, revisiting? Well, revisiting one's columns, uh, as I think you know, can be painful. Um, you say to yourself, oh, I could have done that phrase better. Or I should have sharpened that point. I did a little bit of that, a little tweaking here and there. I mean, I didn't change the the main points of any of the columns, but I, I mastered them a little bit to try to make the reader's experience in the book better. And, and I wanted to live up to the quality of the photographs that I knew was going to be really, really superb. Uh, okay. So um, the thing, the idea with this book was that, um, was to organize the columns thematically, not just chronologically. So there are themes and the themes, um, have to do with urban design, they have to do with architecture, they have to do with historic preservation, and um, bookending those three main chunks of the book are sections dealing with our favorite uh, blood sport in Chicago politics. And so the first uh, chapter compares and contrasts uh, high profile design projects of to former presidents, Donald Trump, the, uh, the infamous Trump sign on the Trump Tower and the Obama uh, Library, or pardon me, the Obama Center. And then the final chapter compares and contrasts our two mayors uh, of this period, uh, more, uh, Rahm Emanuel and Lori Lightfoot. And so by compare, you know, by putting these two together, uh, we see things in a different light. I mean, we see how Lori is much more focused on the neighborhoods and a kind of bottom-up planning process. We see how both Barack and Trump have rather large egos and a desire to imprint their image on the cityscape. Uh, but then as we kind of break down the results, we see that you know Trump's tower, while a pretty good building, uh, was marred by his own narcissism and egotism. You mean the sign, the big sign. The sign, the giant half half as long as a football field, 20, 20 foot high sign that the architect of the building, Adrian Smith, uh, sent me an email saying, before I even wrote about it, saying, I had nothing to do with that sign. <laughs> he was anticipating the critique. Uh, and in any event, uh, you know, so Obama, Obama's presidential center, on the other hand, um, does seem to have something more positive to offer the city through its improvements of Jackson Park. Um, but I'm still, my jury is, at least is still out on whether the uh, museum tower is going to be an effective insertion into the, into Jackson Park. But yeah. that's the point. Yeah, mine too. I mean, the, the tower is something like 232 feet tall. So um, that's like as high as the Monotonoc building is downtown, which, you know, is tall enough in an urban context, it's going to look like the giant land of the giants uh, out uh, on, a, on, a, on a prairie in the neighborhood. But that's for another day. Now, um, personally, how did it feel putting this together? Because as you're doing this, you're leaving the Tribune, you're, you're leaving this post. Mm -hmm. um, you know that you know I, I you know as many of you probably know you know I left the Sun Times once before and that was tough uh, to do but necessary at the time. Um, how was it for you doing this, leaving while you and doing this? Well, 
leaving was great because um i mean i didn't have to have deadline pressure anymore i could like go for a bike ride up to glencoe and island park and not have to worry you know about getting home to like face questions from my editors about change this word change that word this isn't clear so you know i mean leaving was like yeah that was that was great mm -hmm. but um working on the book was a, an opportunity to reflect on and, and you know to try to piece together um these themes and this theme especially of equity in the public realm and i mean one of the things i i thought about that i really didn't think about as i was writing the columns was one of the key themes of the book and that's the double meaning of the word equity um, equity, as we usually use it today, means fair treatment for neighborhoods that have historically gotten the short end of the stick. But mm -hmm. I also look at equity in this book by borrowing from its financial definition, as in equities or shares of stock. My point in the book is that um, we all have a shared interest in the public realm. These are the spaces that we share, the spaces in between our buildings, parks, plazas, streets, sidewalks, you name it. This is where we come together as a people and they reflect whether or not we value each other. And um, I mean, the best illustration of, of that is the Crown Fountain, uh, as you and I have talked about, um, you know, John May Plensa, the sculptor, thought that it was going to be this serene um, tableau where people would be walking on that skim of water between the two glass block towers. Uh, and of course, it turned out to be something very different. Mm -hmm. Children, many of them in bathing suits, many from the city's poorest neighborhoods, turned that fountain into a water park. And the, the theater was so compelling that people stopped to watch it. Uh, and I think what, as they did, they kind of discovered this essential theme that common ground can unearth our common humanity. And that's really one of the key points of the book that, you know, equity and the public realm are interconnected. They really are expressions of, of how we value each other and the, and they are, and they show how, how we can, whether or not we care about each other in terms of what kind of world we say that we share, not just our private homes, our backyards, but the front yards of the city, Grand Park, our plazas, our other public spaces. You know, that, that's such a good point about that fountain. I, I think, you know, we've talked about this, that um, I was in the mayor's office uh, de as deputy chief of staff when Millennium Park was completed. And from the time I was architecture critic uh, during uh, through this time, I saw the same renderings, right? There were, there were businessmen with their um, pants leg rolled up, you know, some sitting by the fountain and yeah. uh, there's a soft opening and the mayor says, Daly says, go, 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 go to it and let me know what you think. So I remember going there and the first thing I remember is just the, you know, me, me expecting to see the renderings brought to life was just the, you know, the, just the joy, the near bedlam of people running through this thing. And I remember this woman uh, who's wearing a sports bra underneath takes off her shirt. I mean, she's just overwhelmed with, 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 with this thing. And, and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's good. It re reminded me when I was a kid here in the seventies, you know, the, um, the Picasso, you see renderings of it, of this, this, this thing sitting there. And then when you go there on the field trip, you couldn't wait to slide down the thing. You know, the public had its own use uh, for it. Um, you know, you know, very quickly, this, very quickly, I want to go to another question. Very quickly, it's also a democratic space, almost like, you know, from day one, I mean, democratic, small d, uh, in terms of people in this balkanized city, yeah. you know, I saw it from day one. People were from every corner of the city, you would think, were there. Talk about that a little bit. Well, that, that's so essential that, you know, we live in this metropolitan area that's that's fractured um, by divisions of race and class. And it's so easy to think of people who are different from us as other. And, you know, we share things. Uh, I mean, it's... It's, it's so corny, it sounds so corny to say, but it's true. And this is one of the themes of the book. You know, I like, the columns look at things like CTA transit stations, like the new Calatrava-esque station in the loop, which is a gateway to Millennium Park, which kind of has this wavy um, uh, canopy. Or, yeah. uh, in which you took a beautiful photograph of, or we look at, or I look at, the new pedestrian bridges um, 
uh, across South Dusable Lakeshore Drive that provide access uh, from the neighborhoods of um, Kenwood and Oakland to the lakefront. They replaced, these are beautiful serpentine bridges, and they replaced rickety pedestrian bridges that did not have um, accessibility to disabled people. And that were, I mean, they were kind of like walking through a prison, you know, um, 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 overlook. Uh, they were just really unfor unwelcoming and, uh, you know, just terrible uh, civic infrastructure. So, I mean, these things, this, th these um, pieces of the public realm are, you know, so important. And um, I mean, I like, you know, it's funny, I bike in Highland Park, Lee, and there's a Highland Park uh, has the, dis oh no, pardon me, in, in Glencoe. Uh, well, there's um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's, uh, there's a great Frank Lloyd Wright hustle on Sheridan Road in, uh, 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 the ward um, in um, in Highland Park, but there's also a, a subdivision of right houses, uh, Ravine Bluffs in Glencoe. And one of the great things about that subdivision is a recreation of, a, of Frank Lloyd Wright's only bridge. It's a bridge that goes over a ravine and it's got, you know, the typical Wright kind of prairie style um, decoration. But what I love about that bridge is that Wright included a little little seating areas so people, you know, who were going over the bridge could pause, sit, look over the ravine. And, you know, it's little touches like that that really make a huge difference in um, in, in public spaces. You know, um, I, I want to ask you next, what is the role of an architecture critic? And, I, and to that question, I want to add a little bit of something to it. We do things, we do criticism, I'd like to think, a little differently in Chicago, right? I mean... I mean, uh, even the, the the viewers might notice that we've we've said almost very little to critics, right? We've said almost very little about how a thing looks, right? We, but but there was a lot of discussion here. I mean, uh, about you know how it fits in with the cityscape. Uh, is, is it of use to the public? Um, and and, and, the, and the looks are important, obviously, because you know nobody wants to live in a brick. But uh, but but there's something different about how it's done and how you did it. Uh, for those 28 years. So talk about the role of the critic and talk about it in that context, if you will. Right, great question. I mean, the the essential role of the critic is to connect the public, the readers of the newspaper with the public realm, the, the spaces and buildings that shape the world in which we live. And um, when you're talking about the public realm, especially in Chicago, you are talking about politics because, um, and you're you're looking at both architects and the real architects of the public of our public spaces and our buildings. And often they're not architects, they're developers, they're the mayor, they're the mayor's deputy chief of staff for design, that would be you. Uh, they're um, community activists, there are any number of people. And all these people, all these different groups come together and um, shape you know, what we experience day to day. So it would be like sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich if you didn't take this stuff into account as you were, you know, analyzing. And um, that's, I think, the, you know, the the point. And I guess what I tried to do in addition to analyzing um, buildings and the forces that shape them would be to do what I call uh, borrowing a term from the San Francisco Chronicles, Alan Tempko, activist criticism. And what that means in simple terms is evaluating essential buildings and plans before they're set in stone, before they're built, in order to give the public a chance to evaluate them, uh, comment on them, possibly improve them before decisions are reached. And, um, you know, in some cases, I think one of the interesting things about this book that, you know, you asked about what it was like to put it together. One of the things I did was for many of the pieces, the vast majority, they have what are called postscripts. So they, the postscripts update the story. So for example, on the Trump sign, um, you know, the Trump sign went up, there was a huge kerfuffle about it. Trump called me a third rate critic on the Today Show. I got the Today Show to run an on-air correction. Um, and then Rom, uh, who hated the Trump sign, got an ordinance passed. Well, I, I just want to jump in, define the correction, because it isn't like you said, 
I'm really a second rate architecture critic. He, he was off by one. The, the correction was very specific about something he said, right? About your well, the correction, um, the correction dealt with Trump saying I was a third rate architecture critic. He also said during an interview on the Today Show, oh, this guy was away from his job for a while. I thought he got fired from his job. Actually, you know, I, as you know, I was on a fellowship at a university out east at the time. But in any event, I mean, the 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 up the um, the updates um, update you on the story, and they show the impact sometimes that a critic can have. I mean, not always. I think you know, you and I would love it if uh, the powers that be listened to our words and took them to heart and did exactly what we said. That's the way it should be, right? Um, but of course they don't. Um, now I think, uh, it's time to turn the tables because you've done a great job asking questions. And now I get to do my favorite part of the interview, which is I get to interview Lee Bay. And right. that's pretty cool because, I mean, we get to talk, we go to lunch at Manny's and other Jewish delis. Um, but we, uh, you know, it's, it's always, it's just fun to talk shop. So Lee, um, I'm curious about your approach in photographing the book. And, you know, like I, I called you up and said, Lee, would you please do this? I love your work. I want you to be on this project. And, you know, you had these 55 columns and, um, you know, how did you go about photographing? I mean, what did you, you know, what did you try to do as you went around the city and you know like did you did you read the columns did they put you to sleep answer on <laughs> and um you know what what was your what was your approach well you know it, it's interesting because you know normally when i write even when i write for magazines uh i shoot my own stuff so i'm always writing to my own words uh southern exposure is very much like this things i've done for architectural record i mean uh, i'm sorry for architect magazine very much like this. And, you know, and you can, and when you write into your own words, I'm not saying you can cheat a little, but but you have an advantage, right? I mean, where you can refer directly to a thing in an image, you, you know, uh, you know, while you're writing. Uh, with this, the challenge was, um, you know, these are not my words. Um, and, and, and I'm not photographing to my words. And, I, and I'm not writing to my, I'm not photographing to my words. I'm not writing to my photography. I thought, okay, all right, I want to do this. I want to see if I could do this. So, you know, I read the columns and tried as best I could, you know, to, to sort of slip myself in your in your shoes. And then, you know, I, you know, we had a lot of back and forth by text too about kind of what you're looking for in the images. So it was about, you know, being able to to do that, you know, but also not being a stenographer. I mean, you right. you know, um, what did the guy say uh, in No Country for Old Men? You you know, you use the, you hire the right tool for the right job or something like that. Of course, it was after he shot somebody, so don't pay any attention to that. And so I, I figured there, that there was something of me and my history and my approach to photography that you wanted in there. The other challenge was, and, and, um, and I guess we can, we can show a few, is that this is the first time that I've shot, this is the first time that the end result, that I've shot something and the end result was black and white. Usually what I photograph is always in color. Right. And with digital photography, you still shoot it in color. You right. process it in black and white. But when you're shooting, your your eye is thinking about things in black and white that it doesn't normally think about when you're shooting color. So I'm thinking about line and form and making sure those things uh, come to pass. Um, making sure the phot photographs are a little sharper. You can see I'm nearsighted. So, and uh, and much of it I shot. Oh geez, much of it. If there any photographer geeks. Uh, most of it I shot with this lens, which is a, a tilt shift lens, which corrects perspective, but it's manual. So when you're out there with a tripod, I mean, you're, you're looking down to this, this thing and you're like, you know, you know, making sure that images are sharp because there's no autofocus. Um, so if you like, you, you want to let me call up a few and we can just sort of go through them or do you want to ask more questions? Well, yeah, no. I Let's get to your pictures because they're they're wonderful. And as you're going to them, I, I just like to point out um, one of the things that I love about the book is that the stock, the pages are coated paper. So they really, um, it's different from ordinary paper because those black and white photos really pop out. 
it, they also make the book heavier uh, than you would think it is. It's about 300 pages, but then when you feel it in your hand, it's um, it's heavier. Now, so Lee, talk about this shot. This is the um, the wonderful Laramie State uh, Bank building, an Art Deco delight uh, in Austin on Chicago Avenue on the west side. Tell us what you were, you know, what was your approach with this shot? Well, with 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 this, you want to, um, I want to pick a time of the day, particularly late afternoon, uh, and this is kind of late summer, I think, as I'm shooting these, where I want the sun to light that terracotta up um, and show all the details. Uh, I'm also working at a disadvantage because this building in color is stunning, uh, even more stunning. It's kind of like this um, modeled uh, golden terracotta color, color. And so um, I have to then use shadow and the brightness to kind of pick up as much of that as I, as, as I can. And as you can see from the bottom, there's a little work that needs to be done. So I need to show that because that's part of the, the story, right? The future of this building is part of the story, but also wanted to show uh, this uh, beautiful facade as, as well. I think it, I think this is a wonderful picture and it really, it, it suggests to me that there's another book for you to do called Western Exposure, uh, the the overlooked buildings of Chicago's West Side, um, building on Southern Exposure. What about that? Is that a possibility? Do you think do you think you would do a West Side book? You know, you know, it certainly is. Um, you know, we've you know voiced a little differently. Probably, you know, a lot of West Side voices in it because I'm, I'm a South Sider. But it's funny um, when this um, the book. You, you know, first came to life as an exhibit for the biennial about, I guess, in 17 Chicago Architecture Biennial. And the first question I got at the exhibit was from uh, Rufus Williams, a friend of mine who's, who's a West Sider. And he said, you know, Western Exposure is your next book, right? And, yeah. uh, and I was like, okay, okay, all right. All right yeah, indeed. Well, look, too, the, 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 you know, the West Side even more so than the South Side is kind of unfairly ignored yeah. the architecture that's there and the, and the people that are there, you know, saving these buildings no, that would be good that would be good yeah let's, let's see some others what uh, what else you want to share with us this uh, yeah. oh yeah so this is um you know so this is this is the this is an entrance to the old cook county hospital now it's a you know it's a hotel and you know entertainment emporium almost on, on the inside and um and this one is a little tougher because i'm because this building faces north so the sun is almost always behind it right so um i have to wait until um, you know, the special hour of the day where at least the sun is hitting this glancing glow from right to left uh, mm -hmm. before the sun goes down, right, and, uh, and illuminates the building. What's interesting about this is that, I mean, who would have thought, if you know Cook County Hospital's history, that there's a wedding going on. So just out of frame to the left, because I cut them off, there's actually, a, I think I cut, well, I think, yeah, I did cut them off for this image. Uh, there's a bunch of groomsmen out there getting, getting their photograph taken. And, uh, and I just, I didn't want to deal with the hassle of, you know, any releases, so I just left them out. But that's it, hilarious. I mean, that's hilarious because you the building looks like a wedding cake. It does. It does with all that, with all that uh, classical ornament. Oh, that's I didn't know that. That's hilarious. It is. It, you know, and it's just you know, it's just a. You, know, you see the sheriff. You know, uh, you know, to the you know in the upper corners there. I mean, this is a building we, that we pass all of us for a century. And you know, you could have, if you had to go in there, you turn up your coat collar and go in, because my God, you, you, you really didn't want to. And to be able to stand there and see that it's really a beautiful building. Um, oh, it's great. It's great. I mean, it's one of the great saves in Chicago historic preservation. And, and it's, you know, it's just a, a reminder that there are great buildings out in the neighborhoods. And again, a, another, another West Side building that will be in Western exposure uh, when that book appears. Uh, you want to you wanna show us uh, some more? Okay. Yes, um, this is one of this is one of the things, and and your book. So glad that you didn't overlook this because I might have missed this if, if I were writing about it. Uh, these are the um, a combination of affordable housing, public library, uh, kind of setups that Ron did around the city. I think there are how many? Of them? There are four of them. I can't remember. Yeah, there are, there are three done under yeah. Ron, and I think one one open recently down on the far south side. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and this is the one that's in Little Italy and, um, you know, library on the first, you know, the first floor or so and then li living above it. And it re and with this photograph, I really wanted to show the dynamism and add it to the street. Right. And so I had to wait around for the uh, I did put people in this one. Luckily, the guy in the bike 
I, he turned away from me. I'm thinking, great, that's just what I want. I want him looking at the building. And, and he does, and there's a, um, a young woman uh, who's, uh, whose son is kind of running around, and I kind of caught them together. Uh, but I really, and I wanted to show cars. I wanted to show it in a, kind of in, in, in a very urban situation that it that it contributes to. So, so including people was in, in some cases important to you. In other words, like you talked about how in Cook County Hospital, you know, you you kept the guys out. But in this case, having uh, action on the street uh, communicated through the the biker and the others was something you wanted, right? It, it was, and um, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell a, I'll tell a secret. I wanted them in all of them, but you never know when you know someone will then you know you get a letter saying you know that's I'm, I'm recognizable in this photograph. Right. Uh, you, you didn't get a release. I shouldn't be telling you this. I'm sure there's some lawyers in the audience that are going to get me. So uh, so um, I used you know sometimes I blurred people a bit you know naturally through motion or I caught them like this. Um, uh, it, it doesn't happen all the time. In a sudden exposure, there's a woman um, coming out of Pride Cleaners who's holding laundry, and I had to I had to show someone with laundry coming out of the building because otherwise people would think that the building was vacant. Right. And I held my breath and everything else for like six months, thinking I'm going to get a letter from somebody saying that's me in that photograph, and I want some compensation. But so far, it hasn't happened yet. So that's the reason why they're, they're you know they're there are images of, of people in some and, and then not in, and not in others. Right. Other shots you want to show us? Um, here's one. This street, I, I, I so badly, this was um, 64th and was it Champlain or Woodlawn? I can't remember now. Um, where, the, where the Emmett Till House uh, is. Um, maybe it's St. Lawrence. I can't, I can't remember. And I, I, des I desperately wanted someone to walk in front of this house because there's faces, you know, maybe Till Mobley's face, uh, to the left, to the right there, and of course, young, young Emmett, uh, well, you know, Emmett, uh, uh, to the center. And I wanted a person to walk by, and nobody would. So after hanging out there about thirty minutes, I just gave it up and just said, "Okay, I'll just get real close, and the trees will do some interesting things." And and you got this important thing. Dare I say, I got to throw this question back to you. This was a great inclusion in that book. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, Colin. I mean, yeah, and I think one thing we we uh, why don't you talk about the, um, well, I'll tell you what, I, we, it's in the book. And um, one of the points here was that you can have monuments that are modest in scale that are moving. Um, they don't have to be big and monumental like uh, the bean. Um, but we can talk about the cover design, but it's probably best if we show the cover because this image actually appears on the back cover of the book. But I'll tell you what, this is so fascinating. I just want to keep going. Let's look at some other pictures um, as well. Uh, we got to put a freight Wayne right in here. So there's Roby House, uh, right. 57, 57 South yeah. Lawn. You know, you know the history of that, of course. Um, uh, you know, nearly nearly wrecked. It took Wright himself coming to Chicago in the 50s to, to help save the building and and, uh, and getting Rich J. Daly on, on board. But you know, here's a building that's 100 and what, 17 years old now, and it looks as fresh as it did uh, the day it was built. Yeah, and I love your photograph of it because it perfectly captures the architecture of the building and you just slipped in on the right, uh, you know, that tour group. And so again, there are people there and this is not just a, a beautiful object, a, you know, the, the masterful Prairie School, um, building that it is, but it also is part of a living city. And you see that, you you know, you sense by by having those people there, you also sense the scale of the building. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it just, it works so well. The lighting is beautiful. You really see the, just the great horizontality of, of the, um, so many elements of the design. It's, it's really a wonderful shot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then a little bit further south, a block or two or three. Um, Wait, that's not in the book. <laughs> oh, oh, it, it isn't. You talk about it. Jeez, I, Wait, you show, you're showing your outtakes, your cutting room floor stuff. That's right. That's right. This is an outtake. Well, then, then I'll pass over this one quickly. But this is um, uh, Edward Durrell Stone Building at the University of Chicago campus that's been restored into new life. It was the hardest one to photograph, but as you can see, that building is very wide, so I had to use my widest lens. But let's let's go on. Uh, <laughs> Now these now one of these is in the, this is in the book, right? I know this one is. Yeah, both are, both are. 
Yeah. The State of Illinois building. Um, I've, I, you know what? I photographed this, this exterior photograph, the day Helmet died. L later on in the, in the day, I was renting a car. And this is before you came to me with the book. I was renting, renting a car and I was taking it back. I did an interview uh, with a TV station on the plaza and then was walking to catch the Metro, I think, and, 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 and shot this. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know, you know, loved, hated, um, but since then bought by Google, uh, which has an eye toward rehabbing it. The, the, the couple of governors wanted to tear it down, sell it to someone who would tear it down. And the thing just, just held on, but just an incredible building. If you're here in Chicago in the 1980s, uh, and this, when this thing got built, it was like the thing to see. Uh, so it was fun to revisit. Yeah, that's great. No, I, and yeah, this shot is really important because I think it shows, and again, this goes back to who, the question, central question of the book, who is the city for? Here's the atrium, which you captured so well. And, um, you know, the question is whether Google is going to keep this space open to the public or not. And this was one of the big reasons for saving the building, right? I mean, the, the, whatever you think of the kind of weird postmodern exterior with its wacky colors, the, the uh, atrium is a, an incredible space uh, and really a, a, like a, a kind of internal public plaza. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, you know, you, you've really um, captured the, the monumentality and the, the beauty of that space. Well, I mean, what, as you shot this, um, you know, why did you pick this particular angle? You know, because it, it, you know, I picked it because it kind of shows everything. I mean, there's the architecture that we, the, the, that we focus on, right? And it's by this distinguished architect and it's a government building. And then when you look at that, when you look at into the details, you kind of see the workaday nature of the building. There's a super cuts in there. You see that? Yeah. Uh, and a GNC nutrition, who the hell? And a Sprint store. And if you go down in the balls of this thing, there's a Sbarro and, and other kind of things. So, you know, so, and, and that to me is probably the beauty, the, probably the beauty of the building uh, that, you know, it has this kind of, you know, if, if you like it, and I do, it's kind of high art element. But if you look closely, it's as Chicago as a two flat. Right? Yeah, oh, that's uh, great. In, in many respects. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I wish we could go on uh, showing more of these pictures up Tribune Tower. Now that's uh, a sometimes guy had to shoot the Tribune Tower. Man, I mean, that's that was a hard assignment, I'm sure. Um, anyway. Well, um, yeah, because, you know, my old building was across the river and it's, and it's torn down. So it's like. I, I whatever you may have been going through, I was I was there, you know, with you, uh, you know, a decade, two, a decade and a half before. It's tough to see a place where you made, you know, some some personal history and then put some work in, and all of a sudden it, it's no longer yours. Exactly. Well, um, we promised um, that we would answer questions from the audience, so I think Beth is going to. Uh, uh, throw a few of those at us and hopefully we'll be able to uh, respond in a way that's semi-coherent, at least in my case. So uh, fire away, Beth. Okay, well, first, Lee and Blair, I want to thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation and for the photos that you shared. Um, it was a real treat. Before we start with the questions and answers, I just want to remind everyone to um, enter your questions in the Q&A box. And a short, a very brief poll is going to appear on your screen for just about 10 seconds so that we know how many are joining us today. So um, the poll should be coming up. Uh, any second, and we'll have you fill that out, and then we'll move on to Q&A. It's not Chicago, but it's close enough, Blair. We can't vote. Oh, I can't vote. Oh, man. Oh, what a bummer. Okay. I and you gonna... can only vote once. Oh, okay. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Okay, um, we have a question from Hannah who is asking, what is your favorite building in Chicago? So I'll let each of you uh, respond. Oh man, uh, the, the standard architecture critic response to that question is, that's, that question is kind of like asking a parent to name their favorite child. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, okay, I'll throw out a few, a few, you know, favorites though. I love Louis Sullivan's um, Carson Perry Scott store at 1 South State Street. 
I love the Tribune Tower. I love the Wrigley Building. Um, I love the United Terminal at O'Hare, at least in its at least in its pre <laughs> pre nine eleven uh, state when it was uh, a really revolutionary statement in, in air travel. I love Millennium Park, the Riverwalk. Um, okay, that that's enough, <laughs> Lee. Um, you know, it, it, it's tough. It, 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 and, and it largely depends on what mood I'm in. Like, for instance, for decades, my favorite building was Lake Point Tower. Um, you know, uh, you know, sensual, curved, sitting out there on, on, on the lake. And, you know, then you go inside and it's like, I don't know if I like it as much. Uh, so maybe that, but that, but that would, it would be somewhere in the top, in, in, in the top. Um, I've mentioned this before. I like the, the Levisorio Youth Center by Jeannie Gang in the Auburn Russian community, uh, 76 in Aberdeen, somewhere in there. Uh, it's part of the SOS Children's Village because it was done on a shoestring budget and it is one of the most humanizing, you know, uh, uh, you know, childcare buildings I've ever seen. Uh, so that would be on, on my list. Uh, and then the rest of them, it's like a fog, you know, you know, I mean, wake up at 2.30 in the morning and, and have a favorite. And then by 8.30, the next morning after a couple cups of coffee, it's like, why? I don't know. I, I like another one better. Thanks. Thanks for sharing those. Um, someone, Karen, is asking, why did you choose to show the buildings in black and white rather than in color? Well, you know, the assignment came to me that the book would be printed in black and white. And it's good to, it good, it's good to know that before I shoot, because then, again, I can, you know, black and, you know, knowing when to shoot in color, but then process in black and white. I really want the pictures to be crisp, and I want them to uh, emphasize form, line, and shadow. And so it was good to know this beforehand. And then, you know, and it's more than just hitting the hitting the black and white filter when you're doing this. I mean, there's a process to how you bring some of these details out and all those things. So uh, that's good. And and I like the challenge of shooting in black and white. I've never really done it before. Uh, so this was good. And Blair, you gave Lee that assignment. Was there a specific reason about printing it in black and white or? Well, it really wasn't my decision. It was the University of Chicago Press. Um, the the two previous collections were black and white photos. Uh, I, I think color color images are very expensive, uh, and so you know I think there are the realities of budget that one has to deal with in a project like this. Uh, I'm really glad it's in black and white because I think that, um, as Lee said, black and white uh, is a medium that accentuates structure, line, the essentials of architecture, and. You know, he is such a good photographer, he grasped that and incorporated it into his work. So I think the book is better for being in black and white uh, rather than color. I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, let's see. Andre is asking, how important is the Chicago River to the sense of place of Chicago? And the same for the Lakeshore. Huge. I mean, the lakefront, without the lakefront parks, I mean, Chicago is Cleveland, uh, you know, I mean, the difference between what we did to our lakefront and what they did to theirs is, uh, you know, day and night. Uh, the riverfront is uh, a similar, uh, there's, it's a similar issue and it's been fascinating to see the downtown riverfront change uh, in recent years. I mean, as recently as, 20 years ago, it was still like, um, not quite a sewer, but close. You wouldn't want ever to, you wouldn't want to dip your finger in it because, you know, you'd come out with like half a finger. Um, now, of course, with the downtown Riverwalk, people, you know, stroll along it. They, they fish there. Um, again, though, there's this issue of equity. Um, how are the branches of the Chicago River going to be developed? Will there be river walks on the south side as well as the north side? Will there be river walks that are welcoming to the public in the new casino, Lincoln Yards, the 78? Um, so the, the river, you know, is the, the riverfront is hugely important because the Chicago redevelops its soul, its neighborhoods. Uh, the river front can be an, an incredible amenity for those neighborhoods that can create open space that's close to where people live, mm -hmm. and enhance the value of, of homes, you know, on the Northwest and Southwest side. So it's, it's critical to the future of Chicago that the, 
advances of the downtown Riverwalk continue to the neighborhoods as well. You're so right. I couldn't say any better myself. So right. Okay, let's say um, Brad is asking, can you give a few details about Mayor Lightfoot's development projects on the west and south sides? Can 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 we give what? I'm sorry. Oh, a few details about Mayor Lightfoot's development projects on the west and south sides. Sure. So um, the idea is to take a, a commercial corridor in a neighborhood like Englewood or Austin. And the idea is you don't wipe it out and start with a clean slate like architects and urban designers were doing in the 1950s and 60s when they built the disasters of the Robert Taylor homes and Cabrini Green. The idea is to knit buildings into the existing fabric of those neighborhoods. So for example, like the Laramie State Bank that where Leeds showed you that beautiful photograph of that Art Deco building, that's gonna be restored uh, as part of a plan to do a mixed use project um, on that site. So the, so the Laramie State Bank building will have um, a blues museum, uh, some kind of financial institution and other uses. Next to it will be a four or five story modern apartment building that has affordable housing in it. They will also pay attention to the streetscape because if you're in um, the Austin neighborhood, you'll see that the, there aren't a lot of trees, there aren't a lot of beautiful, there's not a lot of beautiful brickwork like you see when you cross the border over into Oak Park. So the city again is focusing on redeveloping these sites, but it's also focusing on redeveloping the public areas around them because uh, the city recognizes quite correctly that you have to do both if you want to um, have a, a lively, attractive business district. And that's the basic idea that's being um, worked out in these 10 different neighborhoods uh, throughout Chicago. Lee, do you, have a, do you have other things you want to add? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, you know, and, and, and proof that the city, you know, in the past can really muck up a retail project, retail, um, rent, uh, you know, restoration project like this, got to look no further than the Inglewood Concourse Shopping Mall. I won't go into any, any details because it'll take me all night to explain it. But if you're looking up things, look up the Inglewood Concourse Shopping Mall. They took a viable but, you know, flagging, uh, retail corner at 63rd and Halstead and tried to turn into a suburban mall by closing off traffic and they tore down all the buildings around the intersection in order to put parking and, and it just killed them all uh, and, and it's, it is one of the things that the city now some 50 years later almost is trying to fix so if, if a city comes in I mean a city can muck it up so the fact that they want to come in with community engagement as Blair said and coming at it come at it a different way is really a sea change in how we think about stuff in the city. Okay, Robert is asking, uh, thanks for that, by the way. Um, Robert is asking, considering equity, what do the two of you think of the transforming use of public parkland for privately proposed projects such as the Lucas Museum and the Obama Center? Well, I think there's a key difference between those two projects, uh, and that's in the book. Um, so the Lucas project was something that I fought tooth and nail uh, because I thought it was an incursion of a private project on the city's lakefront, which is supposed to be uh, public space. Uh, and it's why was it a private project? Because you had to pay to get inside. I mean, pretty simple, right? Uh, and also it happened to look like a giant space mountain, uh, kind of like Jabba the Hutt. Um, uh, architecture, not uh, not very attractive. And if you combined it with the Field Museum, Soldier Field, the Lucas Museum, and McCormick Place, you had a really a, a concentration of very large buildings all jammed together. Uh, and that really was antithetical to the openness of the, of the lakefront. The Obama Center, I think, is different. First of all, it's west of DuSable Lakeshore Drive. Second, um, you will be able to enter that building without paying to enter. The, the museum, you will have to pay to enter, but the public space of the building will be open. Um, so that's, that's an essential difference between the two, and that's why I did not see 
the Lucas Museum as a private incursion on public space. Um, Lee, you, you may feel differently, um, you know, but- you know, I wrestled uh, over the design of it, particularly, I, I mentioned it in the Southern Exposure, the design was a little less refined at the time. I, you know, my, my feeling about the, my feeling was more about the design of the Obama Library that I didn't like. I thought, if you just have to put a building in a park, we can, we can do something better than this. Something that's more organic, something that's less, that's not this kind of stone mountain thing. Um, I haven't written anything about it since I've been an architecture critic when I see it come on the ground more. Uh, the Lucas Museum, now that's an interesting one. Now I'm going to say something that many people probably know, but not many, but not many people know, which was I was on the site selection committee. Um, this was before, this was when I was working at the University of Chicago, and they were hunting for sites at the same time, the Obama Library and the Lucas Museum. So mm -hmm. I had this crazy back channel thing going on uh, with some people at the University of Chicago and, you know, Suppose this site gets picked, and and what's was that? Site? And you know, and where I wanted it to go, and of course it didn't go. The Lucas Museum, and and George Lucas wasn't even remotely interested. Was Southworks? Um, I thought if he wants a lakefront site, that's transformative. Have I got one for you? Yeah. And uh, and no interest. And at, and at that point, I think maybe I didn't come to meetings as often <laughs> as, as, as I did before. I just thought, okay, this is wired for something else, and I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. But that, I mean, you know, the Lucas Museum was a classic instance of who was the city for. I mean, this was like, you know, this was George Lucas saying, hey, the lakefront's mine. I want to put my monument there. And, you know, screw you and your tradition of forever open, clear and free. I want my job of the hut building on your lakefront. And Rom went along with it. And it was like, come on, Rom. I mean, give me a break, you know, and it was it was crazy. Um so I was really glad that a judge, you know, stepped in, slowed it down, mucked up the works, and Lucas took his crazy building and his building in Los Angeles instead. Okay, I think we have uh, time for a couple more questions. Uh, someone asked, I was in two separate conversations in the past week where people said disparaging things about the Menandnak building. I don't know if I pronounced that right. What do you both think about it? Disparaging things about the Monadnock building? What's to criticize about that building, I wonder? Well, okay. I mean, like, so the Monadnock building is, um, well, I mean, there was criticism of it, you know, when it opened. In other words, the original Monadnock building is this very severe uh, load-bearing uh, brick structure, which kind of, you know, has a sloping facade. And when it opened, people thought that it was too undecorated, that it was too severe, that it was too Egyptian, blah, blah, blah. But as time has gone along, I mean, people have recognized it for the, the architectural masterwork that it is. Um, I love the Monadnock building. I mean, there's really two sides of it. There's the load bearing side, and then there's the steel frame side, which is just to the south. Docents for the Chicago Architecture uh, Center, you know, do this kind of side-by-side -side comparison of, um, you know, this is the way you we used to um, build buildings where the exterior walls were the main bearing element. And the, the new uh, way of building that Chicago helped to pioneer, where you had an internal cage of steel doing the structural heavy lifting, and the outside was simply a curtain of terracotta and glass. So, I mean, criticizing the Monadnock building is a tough one because that's kind of like criticizing, I don't, it's like saying, you know, Frank Sinatra can't sing. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, architect, you know architecture is a, is, a, is a story of a city and, and this is an important chapter. Um, it, it's like if there were a, a portion of Godfather One, it was Godfather One and Godfather Two, and if there were like a 30 minute, um, you know, movie that was right in the middle of the two that explained some things, that's kind of, you know they, they link them together and you couldn't tell one story without the other that's kind of what's happening here i mean it's a it, it completes the story of skyscraper design not only in chicago but but, but i think internationally but it's a it's a really important story and they don't have that in new york right lee <laughs> they don't have monadnock one and monadnock two in new york i mean this is one of the things you walk through downtown yeah. chicago you get a short course in the history of the skyscraper i mean new york has some you know obviously has some great buildings but they don't have anything like Monadnock 1 and Monadnock 2. Mm -hmm. um, our time is almost up this evening. So um, we'll ask one last question. And uh, I think it's uh, perhaps a great way to end this conversation. To both of you as critics, do you, and it comes from uh, 
an anonymous attendee. <laughs> to both of you as critics, do you believe your writing has impacted the city in any tangible way? Sure. Um, in limited cases, um, every once in a while, the powers that be will listen and they will do the right thing, but not always. Uh, I've certainly lost more battles than I've won. But, uh, you know, as the postscripts in this book show that every once in a while, um, a critic will point something out and something good will happen from it. The, in my case, the most important example of that is, a, you know, a series I wrote in 1998 about the Chicago lakefront, pointing out the disparities between the North and South lakefronts, how one was packed with great amenities, it had great acreage and access, and that was largely because it was lined by white affluent neighborhoods and the South Lake front in contrast had, you know, was, was second or third grade in all those categories in part because it was lined by poor African-American neighborhoods. And, the, and in response, the city um, planned the South Lake front has built new bridges there, um, marinas, playgrounds, et cetera. It's a very different lakefront than it was today, but honestly, that's an exception. And, and, you know, in many cases you write stuff, and they don't do what you want, but you hope that it affects public discourse. And so the next time around, people do the right thing. Exactly. And very quickly, I wrote a series on the preservation of buildings in Bronzeville 20 years ago during my first stint at the Sun Times, so architecture critic. All of these important buildings that said something important about Black history, nationally and locally, they were all in demolition court. And the, and the work that we did there yanked these buildings out of demolition court, and all of them are saved today. And just one inch. Interesting example. I wrote an editorial, or the Sun Times wrote an editorial a couple of days ago about the about the need to reopen the racing stop on the Green Line. Small, you know, thing, but a big thing for the neighborhood. Um, CJ was unwilling to do it. Maybe so. Maybe we'll do it. Uh, but just before I got on, I got a letter from um, from Dorval Carter, CJ boss, saying, "Oh, we were going to open it up all along. I've been trying to get money for that thing since you know 1942, and uh, and it's going to go on the paper uh, sometime this week." So. At the very least, it's a coincidence, if, if not, if nothing else. Well, um, I think we've come to the end of our hour, and I want to thank both Lee and Blair so much for joining us tonight, and to our audience too, but um, for providing such a wonderful conversation. And I know that Raz and Grace are hopping back on to say goodnight. And um, as everyone is signing off tonight, there'll be a short survey that you'll see on your computer screen. Uh, and the uh, link to the book was, uh, will be is in the chat box and you'll also receive a follow-up email with a link uh, to the book from the books, book style. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Blair. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Our pleasure. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay.